Good morning, all. Uh, I want y'all to know that, like most of you, I'm usually on the opposite side of this pulpit. Uh, but in that, I'm so thankful for this privilege this morning, just to share God's Word. Um, it's always a privilege, and I count it as that, knowing that in that, that I don't think I'm worthy, but God says that he's called me to do such as this, so therefore, this is what we're going to do this morning. In saying that, um, we're gonna, our text is, main text is going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, if you want to be turning there to verse 14. And I'll go ahead and, as you get there, we'll go ahead and talk about our outline this morning. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is, is the power of the cross. The second thing will be the wisdom of the cross. And last of all, the glory of the cross. And I want us to touch just a little bit on this book. Um, Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth. Uh, he had visited there in approximately 51 AD. And with that, the, the Corinth that he visited is, is west of, of Athens, Greece, and, and was southwest of where modern-day Corinth. Corinth still exists, the modern-day version of it. And in that, just because of its location geographically, it, it's a place of trade. Um, with having uh, bays on both sides, and it was an isthmus, making it a very short path. And in that, again, they, they, they even developed a road where they ported ships from, from one sea to the next across this isthmus. So it was a place of trade. And with that place of trade comes many, many from different cultures because it's a place of business, it's a place of wealth and of prominence. And we can recognize because of that it became a melting pot. Um, these different cities in Greece, they each had their, what they would call the god of their city. And, and in the ancient, ancient Corinth, it would have been Aphrodite. And later on, as the Romans conquered and overcame this city, it would have become Venus, which was the, the love goddess of, of Rome. So as we recognize these things, just with all of those elements there in the culture, just to give background of this text and where it's headed with that. Um, and the Romans, they destroyed again, ancient Corinth in 146 B.C. and rebuilt it in 44. By the time Paul had visited there, this city was a little over 100 years old. So it's just this bustling place of newness, of a, of a new people coming together, developing a society. Um, I think of our country, our young country. In the scheme of things, America is a young country, a melting pot of people. And therefore, we can realize that uh, this church here, it was planted by Paul. And later, as he wrote this letter, uh, they say this letter, the scholars say, written in roughly 56. So five, five to five and a half years after he first visited and the church was planted. I want us to realize in this chapter, he begins this letter by reminding the church of who they are. He tells them they're fully equipped because of their relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's not of themselves. Next, he speaks of the contentions and, and who they were due to the following. And he asks this question in verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now again, we're going to begin out in our text here in a minute. Uh, Father, God, again, I am so thankful. And God, I just help. I ask that you just, Lord, work in and through this message, God, that your word penetrate, penetrate each of our hearts, Father. Father, that as we encounter you through this, Father, that we truly go away changed. Um, God, just impart in each of us a nugget of truth. Father, we thank you and praise you for that. Before I begin this, and, and I want this to make sense uh, again, and I, I want us to focus on this cross up here for just a minute, okay? And that, that's the core of this message, and I realize that. But we look up here, and, and we see... This cross, there's a sense of order to it. it. It's got the same size uprights, the same cr size cross piece. And it's a glorious reminder, a symbol of, of that cross that Christ went to. But in that, to think about the order that we see here. And, and it's almost a, an incredible thing, the contrast and things with the wall behind it. And again, we don't worship the cross. I want to make that very clear. But in, in thinking about that, when Jesus was hung up on the cross, we have to realize it was not a, a well-developed, sculptured-out cross. It was something thrown together. And in that time, 
It was the way they carried out executions, that they executed people on the cross. We realize that even the day Christ was crucified, there were others hanging beside him, criminals, thieves that hung beside him. So with that in our minds, I want us to consider how normal does that seem to us to think about that's the way God would choose to carry that out. And we're going to see in this text that, that how God, in his wisdom, chooses to do things. And that sometimes confounds us as men and women. And that's the thing I want us to focus on here today, to recognize that God, in his divine ways, made a way that all could come to know him. And that's the focus of this. I want to say this as well to the church this morning. Let this be an encouragement to you to know that you are equipped. If, if you know this text, and this is a very familiar text to you, that tells me that you are well equipped to share this with others. If it is not, if, you, if, if this is your first time truly encountering the truth of the cross, I pray that you will accept as God, God reveals that to you this morning. Let's get started. And we're going to start out here in, with the power of the cross, and we're going to start out in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. It says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and, and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I, all, I also baptized the household of Stephanos. Beside, I do not know whether I baptized any other. You know, Christ, uh, Paul here is just making it very clear. He wants no part of the, the discontentment in the church, of the disunity. And he's clarifying here, again, he also doesn't want men following after him. And we need to recognize that. We do not need to follow after man, a preacher, uh, a church. We need to follow after Christ, him being the head of the church. And as we, we move into our verses here, chapter or verse 17, it said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And I want us to just think about this for a moment. The fact of Paul, and we recognize he was learned. If, if you know the history of Paul, he was learned. He knew the scriptures. But even in this verse, he says it's not with man's wisdom, not with his wisdom, not of what he known, lest the cross should be made of no effect. It is of what God has done. And of, of what he gives us even here in this text, to know it's not with the wisdom of words, but it is with the cross that that's what should be made in full effect. And as we think about those things, I want us to turn to the book of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 11. Romans chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 11. This tells us, it says, For the Scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And as I think about that, will be put to shame. Uh, we live in a culture right now that, that makes it sometimes hard to share our faith. Uh, we sometimes feel ridiculed. We sometimes feel belittled. And even as adults, we need to strongly consider this. Uh, we, we speak of peer pressure even in our youth and our children. But even as adults, if we're not careful, we succumb to peer pressure. And, and out of those peer pressures, we sometimes become silent. We need to remember that this finally says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. We need to recognize, we need to quit looking this way at, at, at our actions and our, how we're carrying out our lives. Because although this way is important, it should never assert this way. And that's between us and God. And God is very plain that if we've come to know him, that we should never be put to shame. And because of those thoughts that it says, for there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Fully recognizing he's no respecter of persons. It does not matter the ethnicity. It does not matter the culture. It does not matter the place. This is speaking to all. And he has become, he is rich to all who will call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In a court of law, that word shall, that is an absolute. It, it's not a choice. It's not a matter of, well, if. It's accomplished. It means it will be done. And it says whoever calls on his name. 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I want to, I want to talk to a moment about this text, without a preacher. Okay, and, and I realize this, and, and we, we speak of this. Even this morning, and, and I, I'm so thankful for the compliments I received this morning and how I look, but some of them were, you look like a preacher. I want you to say this, as I stand here and I look out, knowing that the majority, if not all of you, have know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm looking at preachers as well. Because this word preach here in this text, it speaks of to proclaim. It speaks of to tell about. And again, if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you have something to tell about. And if we will be bold in that to preach, it says, how can they know unless they hear? And I want to I say this to each of us that are here this morning. Each of us this week will encounter a person that nobody else in this room encounters. Each of us in our goings and our coming know people that, that others do not. We need to be those ones. Because again, it says here to proclaim. And how can they know unless it's proclaimed? So if nothing else is the church, I want you to take away this message this morning and proclaim it. Um, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who brings glad tidings of good things. That being verse 15. Again, beautiful feet. This is, in the Lord's view, beautiful feet of those that go. I want my feet to be beautiful. Even in our culture, feet are kind of a thing, aren't they? Uh, have you ever heard the term, I got ugly feet? <laughs> I have. Uh, you know, boy, your feet are ugly. You know, it's, it's not that. We need to recognize God says when we go and when we proclaim, we have beautiful feet. Being used for his purpose and not being used for the vanity of how they look or the beauty of what we would consider a physical thing, but to carry out his gospel message. But they have all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Who have believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And Christ tells us it's impossible to please God without faith. So to go tell. Let's go back to our text, verse 18. Verse 18 in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians. We'll stick that in there. Okay, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, as we began today, and I spoke to us even about the thought of the cross, it doesn't necessarily seem like a natural thing, even to me, that this is the method God chose to do away with the sin of the world. And as we think about that, how foolish it seems. But it was in God's wisdom that he chose to do this. I think sometimes, opinion, it's God's opinion, I think sometimes God does things that look so contrary to everything we know that if we'll really look at it for what it is, it leaves us with no doubt. This is God. God did this. And to recognize the ugliness of a cross and the beauty that came out of it, that God in His love forgave us all because of what was accomplished on that cross if we're willing to accept that and the beauty of that. I want us to now look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You know, as Miss Betty sang this morning, and we think about what this says, this first verse, let the mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, to do the things that Jesus would have done, to carry out what he's asked us to carry out, to live out the purpose of why he's left us here on this earth, and how incredible it is just to have that privilege. And by the way, thank all of y'all this morning for, for leading us into this time of the Word and in, in worship. It says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. I realize there's simplicity in this statement um, to recognize God, Jesus Christ in heaven, leaving that place and coming to this earth. I've often considered that in my own life and knowing what I know about heaven, when I get there, would I ever want to leave? My answer is going to be no, absolutely not, because that means that I would be free of this cursed world, this sin-filled world that we're now in as we pass through as pilgrims. And in saying that, to recognize Christ himself left that place and he came to earth and he made himself a servant of all. Verse 8, and, that, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And we've already spoke on that, to the death on the cross, to shed his blood for the sin of all mankind as the ultimate sacrifice, the finished sacrifice. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the time of Jesus every knee should bow and those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To every tongue. That does not leave a person out. Nobody is left out of that fact that every knee shall bow and every mouth confess that he is Lord. And thinking on the text we read, how can they know unless they hear? It is the, the calling and the purpose of the church that the world hears of this truth, that they have that opportunity on this side of eternity to make that decision in their life, to come to know him, to come to know his truths that they too may accept. Because we can recognize as we pass from this earth, every person will stand before him. I want no one to stand before him and be told, depart from me, for I never knew you. We, we speak of this love and the love that should be in us. We need to love people enough that we set ourselves aside and we tell them this truth, that they too may have opportunity to choose. We're going to realize in the rest of this text, not everybody's going to choose that. But that's not our dilemma. That's between them and God. Our dilemma is, what are we doing with the truth we've been given? I want us to now look at um, and the wisdom of the cross. Let's, let's go back to our text. We're going to look at verses 19. Back in our text in Corinthians. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? We need to recognize that God's wisdom is not dependent upon us. It's not dependent upon our thoughts. It's not dependent upon our ways. We, we speak of these, these philosophers, and at this time, any, any time there's, there's wealth, there becomes freedom of time uh, because no longer is all that time spent merely supplying for needs. It frees up for the arts, which are an incredible, wonderful thing. God has given us creativity for these things. But to recognize that, that through these freedoms that, that there is that spare time to sit around and, and to think of a philosopher, that one that looks at the world and imputes his thoughts to, to what's coming and how things will be carried out. And the scribe, the one that in that time, because of no printing presses, you know, he, he transcribed, he wrote. And therefore, just through the, the act of writing, would know a lot of things about many things. Because, again, as the, these items were taken to him, it would be a vast variety of subjects that would be gone over. And, and just the, the debater, the one that chooses to argue. And, and I'll be honest, I struggle with that method of learning in my own life. Sometimes I debate for the purpose of learning. Um, and that's, as long as that's a debate and not an argument, and I do think there's a vast difference uh, in, in these debates, there needs to be the willingness to understand that, that people do have a, point, a different point of view. 
And a lot of people are coming from a different worldview, and we need to recognize that. And, and again, respect them in that as we try to impart truth to them. And to say that, just this place of prominence that's recognized by most of the world. So we can recognize it's not, it's not man's wisdom that, that brings us to the truth of God. Let's look here in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks after wisdom. You know, it's, um, again, we've, we've touched on the fact that, that God's ways are not always the ways of man. And to realize the Jews, they, they request a sign. This is the way they had known the prophets to come to them, that a sign would be done. And some of the, some of the ones that may be very familiar, when Rose, Moses struck the rock, of course he did this in do, disobedience, God told him to speak to the rock and water gushed forth. We think about Abraham and Isaac as, as Abraham and and, and even in this, I, I want to pose this thought to us. Because I've considered it, and again, God's dealt with me in all of these things. But to ask a man to take his son, and I'm speaking about Abraham and Isaac, and to lay him upon an altar and to sacrifice him, that seems, that's, that's out of my mind. But God did this. But God also knew that he would provide the sacrifice. And we see this as a, even a foreshadowing of what he did through Christ as he sent Christ, his son, and provided that for perfect sacrifice. The, the philosophers and their sense of reasoning and their learnedness in how to accomplish and carry out things, that this, even in this, would not bring them to the truth of God because God would confound that and prove where true wisdom came from. Verse 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks. And again, we recognize God is no respecter of persons, and he's speaking to the world in this setting to the Jews and the Greeks. Some texts use the word Gentile there in the place of that, meaning the rest of the world. We need to realize that it is for the world. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, became the foolishness of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In what he did on the cross, that work, it is finished. It is complete. Um, we, we think about man's accomplishments and, and what he's able to do. and Maybe there's some in here that aren't, but I'm awed by the fact we put a rocket on the moon. Uh, we build ships that you look at them and you go, wow, that floats. You may not, but I do. And, they, and these airplanes, these jet liners, I mean, I don't remember the exact dimensions, over, over 300 yards long airplane. How can that thing even go in the air? And this is the intellect and what God has given man and all of his intelligence. And we think about that and we go, wow, it should humble us very much so to say, even in that, to God, it is foolishness. Um, to recognize that he doesn't need that to accomplish his goal. He sent a baby into the world to accomplish and to save ultimately all those that would accept that. Let's look at verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many noble and are called. As we think about that, not many mighty and not many noble, we can recognize that some of these, because it says not many, but as we think about the mighty and the wise, and, and as we go about in life, how easy is it to get consumed with, I got this, I did this, I accomplished this, I've overcome this, to be that one in power and want those to look at and to see we recognize that those aren't the one that God is calling. It said, but God has called, has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God in his ways, it, again, it's just incredible as we think about it, to know that you don't have to be learned. And remember I said as I stand up here, 
to every one of you that is saved, I'm looking at one that is fully capable and equipped to proclaim the Word of God in this world we live in. It doesn't take a university degree. It doesn't take massive learning. It just takes being willing and, and to carry out his purpose. First, here in verse 28, And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring nothing to all the things that are. Here in this verse, uh, we can recognize, just as we've learned this text and if you don't, the, the Jewish nation, um, for lack of a better word, and their bias, uh, their bigotry, despised Gentiles, uh, stayed far, far away from them, felt that they were better than, not to associate with. Um, and to say those words, to recognize, uh, and, and I just found this, and it was interesting to me, and uh, a man of rank among the Hindus uh, and there are castes in that country, and I, I don't know all the ins and outs. I know enough to know that there's levels of who you are considered in society. And not to say I, it, this isn't the place to agree or disagree, but to know that when, that when a man of rank among the Hindus speaks of a low caste person, he calls them, and of course I can't speak Hindi, so I didn't even try to say that. But it translates to this, those who are not. Those who are not. We recognize early in the early church, just as we think about the apostles and, and who they were in their, in their lives, the fishermen, the workers, the carpenters, Christ himself, uh, you know, as a carpenter's son, to realize that how the world might view those occupations. And this is what I want to say, uh, just as a side note. I am fully convinced, is we're, we're told clearly that all we do should be done for the glory of God and not unto man. And as we look at that, whatever, whatever role we're carrying out in life, if we're doing it, seeking to please our Lord and our service to him as we do that, we can fully recognize we are walking in his way. So no job is more prominent than the other. As far as I can tell, it takes them all. Um, if, there are, if there are garbage men in this room, I thank you. I do. Because have you ever thought about a world full of garbage where nobody picked it up? Those jobs have to be done, and that's an honorable job, it, again, if it's done for the glory of the Lord. Um, and to realize that, again, God takes those things which we might seem prominent, he doesn't even use them. He uses those things which we might, that no flesh should glory in his presence. We need to realize uh, it's not God, look at what I've done or what I'm doing. We should glory in, in our Lord, our God. Um, I want us to look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, verse 9. Pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They're drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. God has turned them over to themselves and their pride and in their ways and allowed them to go about and, and their boastfulness as they, for lack of a better word, I'd put it like a rooster in a barnyard. When you set an opponent there, you know, they bow up and begin this, this staggering, this banter that's there. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of a deep, deep, of a deep sleep and has closed your eye, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then, that, then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I, I am not literate, I cannot read. Therefore the Lord saith, As much as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Fear to the Lord of the Lord cannot come from the commandments of men. It is the indwelling spirit, at least in our time, that gives us that fear, that reverence, that humbleness before a mighty God. It says, therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among the people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, 
and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? And shall the thing that made it say to him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? My own life, uh, before I came to Christ, I have always believed in God, had a full belief of, of an existence of God. But in that, I formed my own ways and my own thoughts of, of how this relationship with God is achieved. We live in a world that has many, many ways of, and thoughts of, of how and a relationship with God is achieved. We need to recognize that it is only through God's ways that we come to know Him. It is only through God's drawing, God's calling, that we come to know Him. And it cannot be from the human mind to think of us being a formed vessel and saying to the one that formed us, well, I know more than you. I know more about how to go about this life. Fully recognizing he's given us the word of God as our instruction in how to carry out life. And it came from the very one that created us. I want us to go back and look at our text, verse 30. Verse 30 in 1 Corinthians. Verse 30. 130. The glory of the cross. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. We think about that word righteousness, and that is that we're justified through Christ. By our faith in him, we're cleansed. That, that word, and from the wrong that been covered by his shed blood. Sanctification made holy in the eyes of God. And not because of our holiness, but because of the holiness of Christ and what he's done for us. Redemption. And the word here says redeemed. Redemption. That, that word is the word used when, when a prisoner, somebody in bondage, was paid for. And it, it's used in such a tense that it's paid in full. Um, paid in full, out of bondage, and into freedom. That's the release that, that this doctrine of the cross brings to us as we, as we carry it out and, and, and accept it through faith. Verse 31. That, as it is written, he who glorifies, who, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That is a quote out of the book of Jeremiah. Um, I want us to recognize, and again, this is familiar text to most, but in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any of us should boast, lest anyone should boast. Let us not boast in ourselves. Let us not boast in our goings and our comings. Let us boast in our Lord. I want us to turn to the book of Galatians. Chapter 6. Our, our, I'm going to go ahead and read verse 3. Verse 4 is what's going to be on the board. It says, For if anyone, if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who, ta who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Recognizing again as we're equipped, we're becoming equipped to equip others, to share in the, in the kingdom work of our Lord. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he sows to his flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity... 
Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And Paul tells us that he wrote this in large letters. And I want us to fall on down here to verse 13. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and with this text I'll finish up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll start out in verse 15. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. To me, that's very plain. When we accept and give our lives over to him as our Savior, and Brother Thurman spoke of this on Wednesday night, also in this text, as our Lord, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but live for him that died for us. Therefore, from now on, we will regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Does anybody like new things? I like new things. But this is the new thing that I've liked the most out of anything I've ever received in my life was that newness that he brought on me and the change that he made. And I, I want us to know that is for all that would accept it. Now all the things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that the word that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That us being us, the body, the believers. Now then, we are, all, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pre pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, the glory of the cross. And with that, I'm going to close. And as we close today, I just want to ask a few questions. You know, as we talk about the cross and the ways to God and the acceptance of that, the question must go out. Has there been a point that you've accepted that truth and you've invited Him in and accepted what He's already accomplished for you. The next question I must ask, are you carrying out that mandate of proclaiming, of going to the world by making Him and His ways known to others? You know, there's a saying over here in the, the men's classroom. I, I glanced at it last night as I was walking through. To know Him and to make Him known. Is he asking you maybe to become a part of this body, to plug in here to accomplish the ministries he's, he's given us here, or to follow him in baptism? Again, to know him and to make him known. Father, I just again am so thankful, God, for your word. God, it's truth. And Father, for your wisdom, knowing that it's you and only you that can take these things and make it possible. Father, for the opportunity we've had this morning to hear that word. God, I do pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, at this time, as you've already began to deal with us, Lord, that at this time that decision would be made. God, just create in them a boldness to, to proclaim it. Father, may you just move us, Lord, as a body, as, as part of your kingdom, to be bold in our proclamation of you to go and to do with joy, Father. Father, again, we're just so thankful in all you do and all you're going to do. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. If you wouldn't mind, stand to your feet. Um, we'll be here at the front to receive you. We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.